أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور ينفصنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها الزوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يفلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يدع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعض فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هج محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم والشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل دلالة النار وبعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله Uh, after praising Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and after seeking forgiveness from him and seeking refuge with him from the mischievousness of our souls and wrongdoings of all of our actions and after bearing witness that there's nothing worthy of worship as a deity except Allah he is alone he has no partners and after bearing witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qurashi al-Hashimi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam is his Abd and his Rasul, his slave and his messenger. I then thank you, the brothers and sisters here at this first Muslim mosque in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that I've been hearing about ever since I've been a Muslim, at least for the past 20 years. And actually the honor is for me uh, to, even, uh, to even set foot in this place because this is a landmark for Islam in this country that needs it so badly. So I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala firstly for being a Muslim and secondly for allowing me to finally be able to come and visit the Muslims here even though I was born not too far from here. Um, I'm really honored to be here for the first time, alhamdulillah, and I hope this is not the last time. Uh, I've been asked to, uh, to fill the Stacey Adams or the Bostonian shoes of my Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli from South Carolina because uh, he couldn't make it. I don't know if you knew this, but actually he was the one who was scheduled to speak with Imam Abu Muslima of the Islamic Center of East Orange. Uh, and Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli could not come because another one of his daughters is getting married, I think today or tomorrow. So uh, Brother Musa, Hafizullah, uh, may Allah preserve him and protect him and all of us. I mean, he asked me um, a few days ago, I think it was, to come and take Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli's place to step in those enormous shoes. And I told him that after I make Salat al Sakhar, inshallah, I'll give him the answer. And that's what I did, and I'm here by the decree of Allah. Um, the subject that I've chosen, uh, when he asked me what subject would I like to talk about, and there's a lot of subjects that we, of course, we can talk about as Muslims, was purification of the soul, a tazkiyya, tazkiyya to nafs. And this subject, there are volumes, literally volumes of books written on the subject of a tazkiyya. And a tazkiyya, uh, for lack of better words, for those of you brothers who are um, indigenous Americans, uh, you probably, if you've been in church before you've accepted Islam, and I would imagine that probably most of you were in church at least once before you accepted Islam, you're probably familiar with the terminology sanctified. I think you probably heard this word, right? Sanctified. And the word tezkiah, actually the closest thing that I can think of in English to the word tezkiah is just that, sanctified. So in actuality, one of the three main jobs that the Prophet ﷺ was commissioned 
to do when he was sent to the human beings and to the jinn is to sanctify the people as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in his book وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do basically three things and from those three things we find a lot of occupations and a lot of duties and responsibilities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but those three basic things that he was sent to do وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ to teach the book which is Al-Qur'an Al-Qur'an Al-Majid the majestic Qur'an وَالْحِكْمَةِ and the word hikmah that they translate in many of the translations of the Qur'an as wisdom does not mean wisdom. The word hikmah here does, I repeat, it does not mean wisdom. All of the scholars of tafsir of Qur'an, starting from the Prophet's companions himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because when we mention scholars, we should be referring to the Sahaba first not the people of today. We should be referring to the Sahaba and then work our way down. All of the scholars of Islam from the time of the Prophet are in unanimous agreement that the word hikmah that they translate as wisdom here and then people falsely give a, uh, another tra- uh, definition to that means sunnah. They unanimously agree that the word hikmah, wisdom, means sunnah. So the Prophet وسلم, is told, is, is, uh, Allah is telling us in the Quran that the Prophet وسلم, would teach us the book and the sunnah. And one of the tabi'un, one of the students of the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, when the Quran was coming down, the sunnah was coming down with it. When the Quran was being revealed, the sunnah was coming down with it. In fact, some of the scholars of Islam, they say that the Sunnah came before the Qur'an. Some of them say the Sunnah came before the Qur'an. And that's a discussion that on another date, another lecture by someone more knowledgeable, which doesn't take, enough, uh, doesn't take that much to be more knowledgeable than me, you can get somebody else to talk about that, inshallah. And then the third thing is that the Prophet ﷺ has been commissioned, where you zakki him, to sanctify, to purify, to sanitize, to clean the people. To clean them how? To clean them outwardly, as one of the Jews tried to ridicule one of the companions of the Message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, your, your Prophet has taught you everything, even how to go to the bathroom. He was trying to make fun of the Muslims, as they do today. And his companion, he agreed, that's right. Our Prophet has taught us everything, even how to go to the bathroom. So the Prophet Sallallahu it has come to cleanse the people outwardly and also to cleanse them inwardly. That our hearts and our souls become cleansed. Because brothers and sisters, wearing a beard, wearing a kufi, wearing a niqab, wearing a thawb, all these things are nice. Alhamdulillah, they have importance in Islam. But if you go to Allah and you have a corrupted heart, if you have a diseased heart, if you have a stained, sullied, muddied soul, and you spent most of your time talking about politics, and you spent most of your time talking about the economic program, and you spent most of your time talking about a social program, or you spent most of your time talking about your madhab, or your imam, or your sheikh, or how much you spend on your car, making sure your carburetor is fixed, and your generator is working, and your battery is working, your tires are fl- inflated, and the, and the fluids are working in your car, or whatever, playing back, whatever. And you didn't spend time on that soul and on that heart, you're going to be in very bad shape, and may Allah protect you and me, all of us, from this. You're going to be in very bad shape. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, قَدَ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدَ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Whoever purifies their soul, they'll be successful. Whoever purifies their soul, they'll be successful. Your ethnic background won't help you an iota weight if your soul is not purified. Being African American, being Pakistani American, being Arab American, being whatever, it won't help you an iota of weight if your soul is not purified. 
فقد خاب من دساها and whoever allows it to be to be corrupted he will stint the growth of that soul whoever allows it to be corrupted he will stint the growth of that soul and the same thing with the heart the prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that the children in your wealth and I use Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli for example he has 20 children 20 children Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid Adli who was supposed to come and by the decree of Allah I took his place 20 children and I know another Imam Imam Alameen in Wine Dance Long Island Imam, uh, Jimmy, uh, Imam Abdul Latif Alameen he has 39 children 39 children and Anas radiallahu anhu the one who used to serve the Prophet for over a decade or more when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made dua for him after his mother said make dua for Anas radiallahu anhu the Prophet said Allahu maktur malahu wa waladahu wa barakahu fi ma atitahu O Allah increase him in his wealth in his children and bless him in that which you give him Anas radiallahu anhu said after the Prophet made that dua for me sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Excluding my grandson, I had more than 125 children. More than 125 children. These three examples, two contemporary examples and one distant example, won't mean anything to the human being, to the Muslim, if he doesn't come to Allah with a pure, clean heart. The children, the wealth, none of these, your PhDs, all these things don't mean anything. Don't mean anything. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except for the person who comes with a pure, unadulterated, cleansed, sanitized heart. That's it. So that's why I chose this subject, brothers. That's why I chose this subject, sisters. Because this thing is daily, hourly neglected by the Muslim. We spend a lot of time Wasted time, hours, days, weeks, months go by, and we don't take time to look at our souls and look at our hearts. And there are so many different ways, as we mentioned, volumes of books have been written on this subject. There's so many different ways to purify your soul and to purify your heart. I've only selected one because every day the Muslim, even if he doesn't know Arabic language, even if she doesn't know Arabic, Every day we make some type of dua. If it's just Bismillah or Alhamdulillah, we make some type of dua every single day. So this is why I chose purification of the soul by way of dua. There are some verses in the Quran and there are some books that have been translated and or written on the subject of dua in English. And there are many books that have been written in Arabic by the scholars of Islam of the past. Imam al-Shawkani has written a book on zikr and dua and I'm, when I mention dua, I'm mentioning zikr with the dua I'm including zikr with the dua There are uh, many books written by uh, Qadi Iyad on zikr and dua There are books written by Imam al-Nawawi himself the one who wrote the 40 hadiths that we know about and he wrote a very famous book called Al-Azkar Al-Azkar which is the plural word for zikr which it has all these different types of dua and zikr that the Muslim can utilize in their daily lives. And when reading this book, you'd be shocked on all the different types of dua that the person can use. But most of us really, and Allah knows best, really don't take advantage of these dua. So alhamdulillah, some of these books have been translated. One of them has been written by a sister, Siddiqa Sharafuddin, I believe her name is. I think it's called Supplications in the Night and the Day. I'm not sure. And there's another book that's now in English, Alhamdulillah, that was translated by a brother named Walid al Isa, I think his name is, called Authentic Supplications. If you can, you can utilize these books and you can get an abundance of zikr and dua that will help us get closer to Allah and help us purify our souls and our hearts, inshaAllah ta'ala. We have some verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about dua. 
One of them where Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says, Udu'u rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufkatan innahu la yuhibbu al-mu'tadeen. And a rough translation of this is, Call on your Lord humbly and in secret. Indeed, he loves not the aggressive. Call on your Lord humbly and in secret. Indeed, Allah loves not the aggressors or the ones who transgress the bounds. So in this ayah, Allah is commanding us to make dua. To make dua. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ When my servant asks you about me, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them that I am extremely close. Tell them that I am extremely near to them. I answer the dua of every suppliant when he makes dua. And this is a great mercy, brothers and sisters. This is a great, great mercy for us to know that the Lord of the world has informed us that he hears the dua of every person when they make dua. And he answers the dua. If the conditions that the person who is making the dua have been met by that person, Allah will answer their dua. He will hear and answer their dua. There are some conditions. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ اُضْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, call on me and I will answer you. This is the Lord of the world, رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ telling us in his book, the final revelation to all mankind, that book that we should be presenting to everyone. Because the da'wah is just not to the Muslims. Some Muslims think da'wah is only to Muslims. The da'wah is to the non-Muslims, of course, also. We should not neglect those people, no matter who they may be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in his last revelation, Your Lord says, call on me and I will answer you. This is from the Lord of the world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't lie. A'udhu billah. Sometimes we lie, sometimes we break our promises, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't lie and he doesn't break his promise. From the sunnah, we have some examples of the excellence of dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said on the authority of Salman al-Farisi رضي الله عنه that the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لا يرد القضاء إلا الدعاء that nothing changes the decree except dua. Nothing can change the decree that is written 50,000 years. 50,000 years before all of us were even, we weren't even thought of. Before Allah created all of this, this creation. 50,000 years before the creation, what's going to happen was written. Me pointing my finger right now saying 50,000 years before creation, you listening to my words right now, 50,000 years before creation, this was written that you were going to listen, and it was written that I was going to be pointing my finger like this and sitting in front of this Microphone in this message, the first Muslim mosque in Pittsburgh. It was written. This is called the Qadr. But the Qadr is the occurrence of that which was written. Nothing can change what was written. But something can change the occurrence of what is written. The occurrence of what was written can be averted. As a better word. The only thing that can change the occurrence of you being HIV positive, the only thing that can avert the occurrence of you being a homosexual, the only thing that can avert the occurrence of what was written 50,000 years before creation, that you would be a Jehovah's Witness leaving Islam, waliyadu billah, is a dua. Dua. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, when you see someone who's been afflicted with some type of trial or tribulation, and for those of you who have forgotten, 
the dunya is the, the abode of trials and tribulations. I don't think you've forgotten that, right? The dunya is the abode of trials and tribulations. And one of the scholars of the past said, show me a dunya with no trials and tribulations, and I'll show you a jannah that's not everlasting. Show me a dunya with no trials and tribulations, and I'll show you a jannah, a paradise that's not everlasting. The Prophet ﷺ said, when you see someone that's being tested and tried by Allah, he or, he or she smokes cigarettes. That's a trial from Allah. That's a big trial from Allah to be lighting up some tobacco and some paper and smoking it and jamming your lungs up and messing up your heart with the addition that it's haram, not maku, haram. When you see somebody afflicted by this terrible, terrible sin of intoxicants, they can't put down that crack vial. They have to blast every day. When you see somebody addicted to gambling, going to Gamblers Anonymous, or S Anonymous, Sex Anonymous, or Lovers Anonymous, or whatever type of Anonymous. When you see somebody being afflicted with AIDS or tuberculosis or leukemia, or Ebola, this dreaded disease that kills you in less than nine days. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam said, you should say, Alhamdulillah alladhi aafani mimma batalaka bih, he said, you should say, praise be to Allah who has pardoned me, protected me, secured me, giving me safety from what you are being tested with when you see that person. And has given me superiority and excellence over that most of what he's created. He said, whoever makes that dua, when they see that person being tested, then that thing won't happen to them. If you don't make the dua and you see that person, it may just happen to you. But the dua will avert the occurrence of what was written and the same thing might have been written on you. So you're driving down the road and you see this Jeep turned upside down with the guy's head on the fence and his body still in the Jeep. He's had an accident. You should say, Alhamdulillah alladhi aafani mimma batalaka bih wa faddalni ala kathir mimma khalaqa tabdila. If you say that, that won't happen to you. The dua will avert the occurrence of what was decreed. And brothers and sisters in Islam, if this doesn't help purify your soul, if this doesn't help purify your heart, I don't know what will. This is a sure way to purify your soul and your heart. Also, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, الدُّعَاءُ يَنْفَعُ بِمَا نَزَلْ وَمِمَّا لَمْ يَنْزِلْ فَعَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادَ اللَّهِ بِالدُّعَاءُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in authentic hadith, that dua benefits that which descends and that which hasn't descended. That dua benefits that which descends and that which hasn't descended. So, O oh, worshippers of Allah, it is incumbent upon you to make dua. It's the statement of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And brothers and sisters, wallahi al-azim, as sure as I sit in this blessed masjid on this floor, speaking to you from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There is dua for every occasion. And there's one dua that is dear, and all of them are dear to my heart. But some just stick out, you know, when you know your own self, when you know your personal self. Some stick out for you as a person, because you know yourself better than anybody. And I know myself better than anybody after Allah. No one knows Dawood ad and the sins that he's committed. May Allah forgive me and all of you. I mean, no one knows me better than, I, than, than, than myself after Allah. And I ask Allah to forgive me of my sins. But there are some dua that are so dear to me. And one of them 
is the Prophet's statement sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma inni as'aluka min al-khayri kullihi a'ajilihi wa a'ajilihi ma alimtu minhu wa ma lam a'ala. Wa a'udhu bika min al-sharri kullihi a'ajilihi wa a'ajilihi ma alimtu minhu wa ma lam a'ala. O Allah, I ask of you of all the good in this life and in the next, that which I know and that which I don't know. And I seek reverence with you, O Allah, from all of the evil in this life and in the next, that which I know of and that which I don't know of. And that's just the beginning of the dua. There's some more to it, inshallah. We can return to it later, inshallah, at this time. So we should make dua for the things that come down, that descend on us, and the things that haven't come down. And this is incumbent upon us to make this dua, whatever dua the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has given us. <clears throat> if we want to get closer to Allah and purifying our hearts and purifying our souls, it is important, brothers and sisters in Islam, that we learn the etiquette of a dua, that we learn the manners of a dua, that we learn those times that the dua are likely to be accepted, those places that are dua are likely to be accepted. We like to mention some of the things that revolve around how you make dua. Because for surety, if you've been a Muslim as long as I have, going on my 23rd year, alhamdulillah, probably like me, and probably not as bad as me, you picked up some luggage. And some of that luggage probably didn't belong to the original ensemble of Islam. Probably. You probably picked up some things that are foreign to Islam. And that's why the Muslim, striving to purify themselves, should make muhasaba, should make mu muqaraba. They should have self-introspection. They should take account of themselves. They should do what the department stores do once in a while. Close down the shop and take inventory. Look at what's on the shelves to see what's stale or outdated. Because for surety, if you've just been a Muslim for a year, you've probably picked up some things that are not in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah. So what about 20 years, 30 years, 40 years you've been a Muslim? So now we like to discuss how to make dua. One of the first things that are important in the manners and etiquettes of a dua, and we're not saying this is obligatory, brothers and sisters, we're saying this is highly recommended. They're mustahabat. They're highly recommended. One of them is al-wudu. Al-wudu. And we're going to mention this, inshallah, if Allah allows us tomorrow, when we talk about the prayer. Insha'Allah, one of the priorities of the Muslim. Abu Musa, radiallahu anhu, he said, دَعَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِمَا إِنْ فَتَوَضَّعَ بِهِ ثُمَّ رَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ فَقَالَ اللَّهُمَّ مَغْفِرْ لِعُبَيْدِ أَبِي عَامِرْ وَرَأَيْتُ بَيَادَ إِبْطَيْهِ فَقَالَ اللَّهُمَّ جَعِلْهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَوْقَ كَثِيرٍ مِّنْ خَلْقِكَ مِنَ النَّاسِ On the story of Abu Musa, radiallahu anhu, who said, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam called for some water to make wudu with. Then he raised his hands and he said, Oh Allah, forgive Ubaid Abu Amir. Forgive Ubaid Abu Amir. And then Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu said, I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam raise his hands and I saw the paleness, and I, for the brothers who are extremely Afrocentric, I don't want to say the whiteness because some brothers have a problem when you say that the Prophet was light in color. So I'll say the paleness of his armpit. And inshallah, may Allah remove the disease of jahiliyyah, of Afrocentrism from you. Ameen. And then the Prophet said, O oh Allah, 
make him on Yawm al-Qiyamah, Ubaid Abu Amr, make him on Yawm al-Qiyamah, the day of resurrection, above most of the people who you created. Can you imagine the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying to you, making dua for you, Oh Allah, make this person and naming you by name above most of the people on the day of resurrection that you've created. Can you imagine that? This is a tremendous reward. Also, as part of the etiquette of a dua is making the dua three times. So as part of the etiquette of a dua is making the dua three times. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to amaze him. That's Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to amaze him when he used to make dua because when he made dua he made it three times and when he asked he asked three times. So this is why when you're asking for Jannah sisters you should say, Oh Allah, I ask you of Jannah. Oh Allah, I ask you of Jannah. Oh Allah, I ask you of Jannah. When you're asking the refuge of Allah from the hellfire brothers, you say, Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the hellfire. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the hellfire. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the hellfire. This is from the etiquette of dua with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first is al-wudu, and not necessarily in this order. And the second, is asking three times. We also know from the Sunnah of the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that we should face the Qibla. And it's not necessary to do these things once again, but it's highly recommended that when we make dua, we should face the Qibla. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seen by Abdullah ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu one day when he came out to the Musalla and he was making the dua for rain he raised his hands and then he faced the Qibla, making dua to Allah for rain. Also among the etiquette of making dua is to make dua, but to ask for yourself first. And that's kind of logical too. Before you make dua to anybody, you should make dua for yourself. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas he said that Ubay bin Ka'b radiallahu anhu said the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِذَا ذَكَرَ أَحَدًا فَدَعَى لَهُ بَدَأَ بِنَفْسِهِ That when he would make dua for someone, when he would mention anyone, that he would begin with himself first. He would begin with himself first. This is part of the etiquette of making dua. Also, as Brother Musa had mentioned to me on the way here, that you should have al azima You should have firm determination that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala is going to answer your dua. That you have firm determination and surety that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer your dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا دَعَى أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَعْزِمْ الدُّعَى وَلَا يَقُلْ أَلَّهُمَّ إِنْ شِدَّ فَعْتِنِي فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا مُسْتَكْرِهَ لَهُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, When any of you makes dua, let him be absolutely one zillion percent, and the one zillion percent statement is mine, of course, one zillion percent sure that Allah is going to answer his dua. You should not, brothers and sisters in Islam, when you're asking Allah, Oh Allah, let me make Hajj next year. You shouldn't have 99% surety in your heart that you're going to make Hajj and 1% that you're not. You should have 100% surety that Allah has the ability to let you go on Hajj. You should never think, oh, my supervisor is not going to let me off because I don't have any more personal time. No. Allahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah has power over everything, even your supervisor. And you should ask Allah as though Allah has power over everything because he does. 
And the Prophet وسلم, said, you should not say, Oh Allah, if you will, give it to me. If you will, give it to me. For surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like that you say, Oh Allah, if you want to do it, then do it. No. We should ask Allah with surety that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer our dua. As the verse we mentioned before, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servants ask you about me, O Muhammad, tell them that I am close. أُجِيبُ الدَّعْوَةِ الدَّعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ I answer the supplication of every supplicant when he calls on me. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So let them believe in me and answer my call that perhaps they be guided. And they will be guided if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers their call. Also, as part of the etiquette of making dua, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us to not be extremists in dua. Extremists going over the boundaries, meaning being specific in the dua for the next life. On the authority of Ibn Mughassal, radiallahu anhu, sami ibnahu, yaqul, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-qasr al-abyad an yameen al-jannah idha dakhaltuha. Faqal, أي بني سل الله الجنة وتعود به من النار فإني سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول سيكون في هذه الأمة قوم يعتدون في الطهور والضعاء ابن المغفل رضي الله عنه heard his son saying while making dua this is what his son the son of a companion of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he heard his son saying, O oh Allah, I ask you for a white palace on the right side of paradise when I enter. This is the dua that he was making. And I know that some of the brothers do this. I'm not around the sisters, but I know that some of the brothers do this. They say, O oh Allah, please give me 15 of those Korean women when I get into Jannah. For those brothers who don't know what the Korean are, the brothers who are laughing, they can tell you. Those Hurri'een women are those big, beautiful, bright-eyed women. And I won't go into detail what else they have. But some brothers, they ask for only that. They don't ask for anything else. Just give me 15, oh, okay, 10. Just give me 10 of those girls. You see? No, we shouldn't ask for things specifically like this. So when he heard his son asking for this white palace on the right side of paradise when he enters it, he said, what is this, my son? You should ask Allah for the Jannah and seek refuge with him from the hellfire. For surely I heard the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, there will come a time in this Ummah, the Ummah Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there will come a people, not a time, there will come a people in this Ummah who will be excessive, ex exceeding the boundaries in purification and dua. And wallahi al-azim, brothers and sisters, for the short time that I've been a Muslim, I've seen it with my own eyes. Muslims who have become extremists when they purify themselves, when they make wudu, when they make, well, I haven't seen anybody making wudu, but when they make wudu, they're extremists. They look under their fingernails and they put the water and make sure to, I mean, they go, they extremism. And this is not from the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you see some people becoming extremists in dua, asking for these things specifically. And this is not from the son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. And also, as part of the etiquette of a dua, is that the person should open their hands. The person should open their hands. And unfortunately, the sisters can't see what I'm about to do. Uh, but you brothers who have wives and mothers and daughters and sisters and aunts and grandmothers back there, or fiancés back there, you should explain to them, demonstrate to them what I'm about to do. You see some Muslims, and sometimes these Muslims are from certain parts of the world who have been influenced by the religion of their forefathers. You see them making dua like this. They put their hands together like this. This is not from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to make dua like this. The sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to open your hands. 
with the palms face upward. With the palms face upward, opening your hands. To make dua with your hands like this is not the sunnah at least, and at most it's an imitation of the Hindus and the Christians. So we should abandon this immediately and accept the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is part of the etiquette of making dua and opening our hands when we make dua. And also from a part of the etiquette of dua is to make dua to Allah fi rakha When you're doing good, Allah just bless you with that $60,000 a year job. You got a nice big shiny Lexus, a beautiful wife. Everything is going good. This is the time you should be making dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ صَرَّهُ أَنْ يَسْتَجِيبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ عِنْدَ الشَّدَائِدِ الْوَالْكَرْبِ فَلْيُكْثِرِ الدُّعَاءِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ Whoever has inside the depths of his heart and his soul the desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer his dua when he's doing bad, when he's having frustration and extreme depression and uh, anxiety and sadness and calamities and misfortunes, he should increase his dua when he's doing well. When he's doing well, he should increase his dua. When you're doing well, sister, you should increase your dua so that when things happen to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your dua. As for the time when we make dua, and remember the theme, brothers and sisters, the theme is purification of the soul by way of dua. The times that the dua are going to be accepted, one of them is Jumu'ah. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, what do the brothers miss when they don't go to Jumu'ah? You'll make sure that you're there on time for work, and you'll make sure that you stayed up all week cramming for exams, making sure that you can get that master's in engineering, but you can't go to Jumu'ah. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said on the authority of Abu Lubaba, Ibn Abd al-Munzir radiallahu anhu, إِنَّ الْيَوْمِ إِنَّ يَوْمَ الْجُمْعَةِ سَيِّدُ الْأَيَّامِ وَأَعْظَمُهَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَهُوَ أَعْظَمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْأَضْحَى وَيَوْمِ الْفِطْرِ فِيهِ خَمْسُ خِلَالٍ خَلَقَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ آدَمَ وَأَهْبَطَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ آدَمَ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ وَفِيهِ تُوَفِّيَ اللَّهُ تَوَفَّى اللَّهُ آدَمَ وَفِيهِ سَاعَةٌ لَا يَسْأَلُ اللَّهُ فِيهَا الْعَبْدُ شَيْئًا إِلَّا أَعْطَاهُ إِيَّاهُ وَفِيهِ سَاعَةٌ لَا يَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ فِيهَا الْعَبْدُ شَيْئًا إِلَّا أَعْطَاهُ إِيَّاهُ مَا لَمْ يَسْأَلْ حَرَامًا وَفِيهِ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ وَمَا مِنْ مَلَكٍ مُقَرَّبٍ وَلَا سَمَاءٍ وَلَا أَرْضٍ وَلَا رِيَاحٍ وَلَا جِبَالٍ وَلَا بَحْرٍ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُشْفِقُ مَنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ أَنْ تَقُومَ فِيهِ السَّاعَةِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam said, Indeed, most surely, the day of Jumu'ah is the master of all days. Indeed, verily, surely, that the day of Jumu'ah is the Sayyidul Ayyam, the master of all days. And let me give you a hint, brothers. The word Rabb that we say in Al-Fatiha and all through the Qur'an, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And this outside of the name Allah, is the most used name in the Qur'an, Rabb. The literal meaning of Rabb, the literal, not the religious, the literal meaning of Rabb, sisters, linguistically, the dictionary meaning, is Sayyid, very common name among the Indo-Pakistani brothers. Sayyid. The word Rabb is a direct translation of Sayyid. Sayyid means Rabb and Rabb means Sayyid. Jumu'ah is the Rabb of all days. 
is the Rabb of all days. Not religiously, linguistically. Listen very closely. I'm not saying that the day of Jumu'ah is a Lord. I'm not saying that. I'm saying linguistically, the word Sayyid means Rabb, and the word Rabb means Sayyid. Listen to that statement. In the Yawm al Jumu'ati, Sayyidu Ayyam. That Jumu'ah is the Lord, the Rabb, the Master, the King of all days. It is the most tremendous and magnificent of all days with Allah. It is more tremendous and magnificent with Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu said, than Yawmul Adha and Yawmul Sitr. Yawmul Adha and Yawmul Sitr, the Prophet Sallallahu said. He said, and in it are five special characteristics. The first one, Allah on that day created Adam, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's number one. The second special characteristic, Allah sent down Adam on that day to the earth. And that dispels anyone who believes that the story of Adam and Hawa is and Iblis, la'anatullahi alayhi, may Allah forever curse him, I mean, that dispels the belief that that was allegorical. That this is allegory. Why would the Prophet ﷺ take the time that he doesn't waste like us? He doesn't waste time. He doesn't speak of his own desire. He only speaks revelation. Why would he make that statement that Jumu'ah has five special characteristics but make it symbolic that Adam descended to the earth? No, he literally descended to the earth. That's the second qualification. Uh, uh, characteristic. On that day also, how much time do I have? Oh, okay. On that day also, Allah took Adam's soul. On Jumu'ah, Allah took Adam's soul. How many is that? Three? Number four. On Jumu'ah, there is a an hour, and I'm using the word hour loosely, because the word sa'ah here doesn't mean hour in the sense of a 60 minutes. The word hour here means a time span, a time span. There is, and this is the highlighted point, on times that du'a are accepted, so that we can help purify our souls and our hearts. There is a time period on Jumu'ah that no slave of Allah asks for anything except that Allah gives it to him. And this goes for the sisters too. Even though the women are not obligated to go to Jumu'ah, when they go to Jumu'ah, they get the same reward. There is a time period that if you, Abdullah, and Allah, Allah, the male and female slave of Allah, you Abdul Kareem, you Fatima, you Tasneem, you Khadija, you Abdul Latif, you Bilal, when you call Allah during that time period, there's not one time on that time that if you make dua, that Allah will answer and give you what you ask for. How many Jumu'ahs, brothers, have you wasted gossiping? backbiting, slandering. We won't go that far. Talking about the NBA game or talking about whatever. When you could have been making dua at that time that the scholars of Islam from other hadith say is between Asr and Maghrib on Jumu'ah. Between Asr and Maghrib on Jumu'ah, if you make dua at that time, then whatever you ask for, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give it to you. But come on, man, that's too long, man. Come on, you think I'm going to make dua between Asa and Maghrib? I got better things to do. Yeah, but don't you want Allah to forgive you? And don't you want Allah to have mercy on you? And don't you want your mother, who's been going to church for 63 years, to become a Muslim? And don't you want your father, 
who's been a kafir, and some, well, maybe some people don't like me calling non-Muslims kafirs, who's been a non-Muslim for 72 years to accept Islam, then you should make dua on that time, at that particular time during Jum'ah, ah, between Maghrib and, and uh, uh, between Asr and Maghrib, according to the scholars of Islam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, and I'm saying there is a condition. There is a condition. Ma lam yasal haraman. As long as you, Sister Fatima, don't ask for anything haram. As long as you, Abdul Kareem, don't ask for anything that's haram. Allah is going to give it to you. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam said, and on Jumu'ah, on Jumu'ah, taqoomus sa'ah is the day of resurrection. Jumu'ah is the day of resurrection. That is the hour. And there is not one near angel, nor heaven, nor earth, nor wind, nor mountain, nor sea or ocean, except that it is in awe, in complete fear, in complete, in a trembling state of the day of Jumu'ah, that the hour is going to come on that Jumu'ah. That the day of resurrection is going to come on that Jumu'ah. And you see how lightly we take Jumu'ah? This may just be the day of resurrection. That's the time in which the Sa'ah will happen. The hour is on that day, a tremendous day. The, tr the mountain, the ocean, the earth, the sea, and believe it brothers or not, believe it sisters or not, there are oceans that are not just on earth. There are seas that are not just on earth. There are mountains that are just not on earth. Every single mountain, every single sea, every single earth and sky, every angel is in awe and fear on that day that it's going to happen on that day. Also one of the times that dua is accepted is when the Imam says, Ameen, your dua is going to be accepted. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah azim. Listen to this brothers and sisters. Think about the great loss that you are going to have by following a madhab that doesn't follow the sunnah of the messenger of Allah and you don't say ameen. You stick to your madhab. Well, I was born a Hanafi. I was born a Maliki. I was born a Shafi'i. I was born a Hanbali. I was born a Zahari. I was born, I was born, I was born, I was born. And your madhab tells you, not from the sunnah, from your madhab, tells you, don't say ameen. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا أَمَّنَ الْقَارِئُ فَأَمِّنُوا فَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تُؤَمِّنُوا فَمَنْ وَافَقَ تَأْمِينُهُ تَأْمِينَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ غُفِرِ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ When the imam who's leading the salah says ameen, then you are ordered by the messenger of Allah, he said, then I order you to say, Ameen. That's an order from the Messenger of Allah. And Allah says in the Quran, Whoever obeys the Messenger, obeys Allah. How can you put your madhab over the order of the Messenger of Allah when he orders you to say, Ameen? How can you do it? How can you disobey Allah and disobey the Messenger and keep your mouth shut? He says, if you say Ameen, Al-Malaikatu Tu'aminu, the angels also say Ameen. The angels also say Ameen. And whoever's Ameen agrees with the angels Ameen, whoever's Ameen is in consonance with the angels Ameen, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, all his past sins are forgiven. All his past sins are forgiven. So by you not saying Ami, sticking tenaciously as you should to the Sunnah, 
by not saying Amin, but your father was Hanafi and his grandfather was Hanafi, or whatever other madhab that says don't say Amin, not from Imam Abu Hanifa himself, and not from Imam Malik, or not from Imam Shafi or the others. When you don't say Amin, you lose two things. Number one, you disobey Allah and His Messenger, which makes you a sinner. You're a sinner, you're a criminal. And number two, your past sins are not forgiven. And they need to be forgiven because you disobeyed Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when the Imam says, Amin, as soon as he says the A of the word Amin, you should say Amin. And I'd like to add something to this. In most, and Allah knows best, of the messages around the world today, the Muslims are saying Amin before the Imam. Think about it. When the Imam says, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا Before you even finish Baleen, you're saying Amin. You disobey the Messenger of Allah again. Because the Messenger of Allah Wasallam said, when the Imam says Amin, then you should say Amin. So that means you have to wait for the Imam to say Amin, and then you catch ah, ah, just like this, ah, 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 just like this, right behind him. But you should not be saying Amin before him. And if you do, your past sins are not forgiven, and you're disobeying Allah and His Messenger. This is the time that your du'a is going to be accepted, brothers and sisters. If you say Amin, your du'a is going to be accepted, and your sins are going to be forgiven. Also, one of the times that our du'a is accepted is after the obligatory prayers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the authority of Abu Umama al-Bahili radiallahu anhu said he was said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which dua is most heard? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Jawfu al-layl al-akhir wa dubar al-salawat al-maktubat The prayer that is, the dua that is most heard by Allah is in the middle part of the last part of the night, in the depth of the end of the night, and also at the end of the obligatory prayer. I'd like to make a special note on this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam sunnah was to make dua before Taslim in the Salah. It was not the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. And this may be a shock to some of you. It was not the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. It was not the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah who is Uswatun Hasana, the best of examples. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and then raise his hands in dua. This is not the sunnah of the Prophet He never ever in his entire life as the messenger of Allah, not one time in his life, raised his hands after taslim in dua. Never. And not once do we find one authentic narration of any of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raising their hands in dua after salah. Not one hadith that's authentic. Not one. The sunnah of dua with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for those of you who hope to see Allah in the last day so for those of you who don't, it doesn't make any difference. But for those of you who do hope to see Allah and the last day, the sunnah is to make dua before you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and it doesn't make any difference what language you say it in. You can say it in Arabic, you can say it in Urdu, you can say it in Patois, you can say it in whatever language you want. That's the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's the dua that's most heard. The one at the end of the obligatory prayers, meaning inside the prayer itself. 
Am I saying that you can't make dua after taslim? No, I'm not saying you can't make dua after taslim. Am I saying it's haram to make dua after taslim? No, I'm not saying it's haram to make dua after taslim. Am I saying it's makru to make dua after taslim? No, I'm not saying it's makru to make dua after taslim. But I am saying it's not the sunnah to raise your hands and make dua after any salah. I hope that's clear. Okay. The next time in which the dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bain al-adhani wal iqama is between the adhan and the iqama. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الدُّعَاءُ لَا يُرَبُّ بَيْنَ الْأَذَانِ وَالْإِقَامَةِ That dua is not rejected between the adhan and the iqama. How many times, brothers, have you wasted your time between the adhan and the iqama when you could have been making dua?
See, time, brothers, have you wasted your time between the Azan and the Iqama when you could have been making dua and your dua would not have been rejected. You claim you want a nice sister in marriage. You sisters claim you want a tall, dark, handsome man. You could be making dua between Azan and the Iqama and Allah will answer your dua. How many times have we wasted time? How many masjids call the Iqama immediately after the Azan disobeying Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not giving the people time to do that? Hmm? And don't point me fingers, brothers and sisters, please. Don't point me fingers at any masjid. We know who, 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 does, who do these things. Also, one of the times that dua is accepted is when it is raining. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, اُطْلُبُ اسْتَجَابَ الدُّعَاءِ عِنْدَ الْتِقَاءِ الْجُيُوشِ وَإِقَامَةِ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُزُولُ الْغَيْدِ Seek the answer for your dua, and I'm saying in three times, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when you meet the enemy in jihad, that's number one, when the iqama for the salah, or when the salah is established, that's number two, and when it's raining, and it doesn't make any difference if it's drizzling or it's torrential rain. When it rains, your dua is accepted. It's answered by Allah. You're driving down the street and it starts pouring down raining. You're in your car. But don't take your hands off the steering wheel now. Just make dua. Inshallah, Allah will answer your dua. Also, and I don't know if you have this here, but where I come from, you hear a lot of roosters. A lot of roosters making the cock a doodle doo sound. <laughs> I guess you children, you woke up now, right? You, you heard that? You heard? You know what that is? What, what makes that sound? Hmm? <laughs> what kind of animal does that? A chicken? <laughs> You're from Pittsburgh. You're not from the country. That's what, that's what it is. A chicken? No, it's a rooster. When the rooster crows, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ سِيَاحَ الدِّيَةِ فَاسْأَلُ اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَإِنَّهَا رَأَتْ مَلَكَةِ He said, when the rooster makes that sound, you should ask Allah for his fadl, for his bounty, because surely that rooster has seen an angel. Surely that animal has seen an angel. وَإِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ نَهِيقَ الْحِمَارِ فَتَعَوَّذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ فَإِنَّهَا رَأَتْ شَيْطَانًا And when you hear the brain of a donkey, which is the worst sound to Allah, Allah says in the Qur'an, it's the worst sound to Allah. أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ سَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ The worst sound to Allah is the sound of the donkey. When you hear that, then you should seek refuge with Allah from a shaitan. And in another narration it says, when you hear a dog barking, you should seek refuge with Allah from a shaitan, for surely that donkey or that dog in another narration has seen a shaitan. And what does that tell you, brothers and sisters? That tells you that at least these, two, these three animals are able to see things that are hidden from our view. That tells you that these three animals at least are able to see some of the things that are hidden from our view. As for the person whose dua is accepted, I feel like I'm going over the time. Am I going over the time? No, I don't have three hours. No, no. We're going to stop here, inshallah. As for the people whose dua is accepted, the first category, and not necessarily in this order, is الذاكرون الله كثيرا والإمام العادل The person who makes zikr a lot. The person who remembers Allah a lot. The person who says Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al-Azim. Those who read the Qur'an a lot. Because this is the best type of zikr. 
Those people who do this, their dua is accepted by Allah, it's answered by Allah, and also the just Imam. The just, honest Imam. His dua is accepted as the Prophet said, ثَلَاثَةٌ لَا يَرُضُّ اللَّهُ دُعَاءَهُمْ أَذَّاكِرُ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالْمَظْلُومُ وَالْإِمَامُ الْمُقْسِطُ The three people, Allah never rejects their dua. The first person is the person who remembers Allah much. And brothers and sisters in Islam, Imam al-Shafi'i, if my memory serves me correctly, he has mentioned to show you the wisdom, how the ulama, how the scholars of Islam used to think. He said, based on a verse in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ Those who remember Allah standing, sitting, and lying on their sides, He says, it is important for the Muslim that they should make zikr to Allah standing, sitting, and lying on their sides. How many times have you made zikr and you sat down and you were standing up already? You say, Subhanallah, 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 but you sit down to do it. Allah mentions in the Quran, firstly, those who stand. So that shows us some superiority to sitting, because Allah mentioned it first. And then those who sit, and then those who are lying on their side. That person who remembers Allah much, their dua is going to be answered by Allah. The second category of person is the mazloom. Mazloom, the person who is oppressed. You brothers who have your wives in a situation, those of you who have more than one wife, you have your other wives in a situation where they're either not divorced nor married, where you have them hanging, you haven't divorced them, or nor do you visit them, you stay away from them, this woman is oppressed. And if you keep mistreating her like this, if she made a dua against you, her dua is going to be accepted. The brother who you went into a, a business contract with, and you wrongfully took his money and didn't complete that route, or complete that car job, you are oppressing that brother. If he makes dua against you, his dua will be accepted in answer by Allah. You better be careful. The dua of the oppressed is answered. And the last category, al imamul muqsit The just imam. The imam who is a good imam. He's a fair imam. He doesn't lean to the right or lean to the left because you're Pakistani or because you're Afro-American. He's a just, fair imam. His dua is accepted and answered by Allah wa ta'ala. And lastly, because I don't want to burden the people because it's very late, the person who's answered, whose dua is going to be answered is the person who makes the dua of the Prophet Yunus alayhi salatu wassalam. From Sa'ad radiallahu anhu who said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam in conclusion said, Da'watu zinnuni idda'a biha wa huwa fi batni al-hud لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين لم يدع بها رجل مسلم في شيء قط إلا استجاب الله له. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم said, the dua of Zunun, Yunus عليه الصلاة والسلام, who was in the belly of the whale. When he made the dua alayhi salam, there is nothing worthy of worship as a deity except you. You are far above imperfections and defects, O Allah, glory be to you. And I am of those who transgress the bounds and wrong himself. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever makes that dua, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntum min al no one makes that dua of the Prophet Yunus. No Muslim, male or female, black or white, 
Arab or non-Arab, make dua for themselves. After making the dua of Prophet Yunus alayhi salatu salam, accept that Allah will answer his dua. Accept that Allah will answer his dua. This is very, very important, brothers and sisters. If we knew the va- if we really understood the value of this statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then we would be attaching the dua of Yunus alayhi salatu salam to everything that we do. لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين. It's a simple formula. This thing, this dua is so light on your tongue. It will take you just less than an hour to learn how to say this. Even if you don't know anything about the Arabic language, it's very easy to learn this dua. If you say this dua and then you make dua for yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your dua. So brothers and sisters in Islam, inshaAllah, this is just some of the things that we'd like to share with you of how we can purify our souls and our hearts and get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways we can do it is by implementing these dua. It's implementing the zikr and the dua that has been left for us from our great Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we really want to strive to sanctify and purify ourselves, then we need to implement and execute and utilize these different du'as and zikrs so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer our du'a and that perhaps insha'Allah we'll be forgiven for our sins and Allah will have mercy on us and he'll admit us into his jannah and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for myself and for you because one of the other people that we didn't mention whose du'a is answered is the person who's traveling. The dua of the traveler is answered. So I now raise my hands. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al O Allah, I ask you for Jannah and I ask you to admit those who listen to my voice into Jannah. Amin. O Allah, I ask you for the Jannah and I ask you for those who listen to my voice, give them the Jannah. Amin. O oh Allah, I ask you for the Jannah and I ask those who listen to my voice to admit them into the Jannah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahabi ajma'een which is also part of the etiquette of dua that your dua goes up and it's suspended between heavens and earth until you say dua for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So remember to attach that also to your dua. Subhanak Allah muhamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Anything that I have said that is, in, that is correct is from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And anything that I have said that is incorrect, it is from ash-shaytan or myself. And the end of our da'wah is an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Um, we've all, we all have a big day tomorrow for Brother Dawood and myself and all the brothers who are going to the conference. Inshallah. I hope that inshallah this is the tip of the iceberg. And for you brothers, I hope that everyone is inspired, inshallah, who wasn't going to come to come. Um, so we're going to allow a short amount of time, just a short amount of time, because the brother has to get some sleep, and we have to get some sleep. Um, but it also, one note, it's from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, so from to delay the Isha prayer. And a lot of times brothers sometimes have a problem with somebody pushing the prayer back. If it's Isha, the Prophet, so it's like to delay the Isha, even sometimes until half the night. So, inshallah, with this, we're going to take some questions. I'll do some assistance. Okay, we have some questions from the sisters, then we'll take some questions from the brothers for a short amount of time, inshallah. Uh, there's a series of questions here, and I don't want to be disrespectful, disrespectful, but I would prefer to, uh, to forego the questions that don't revolve around the topic. There are some questions here, the first one on top deals with pictures and videos and things like that. I'd like to leave this on the side, inshallah, and if they're not dealing with the subject, a purification of the soul by way of dua and or zikr, then inshallah we can deal with this um, later, inshallah. Then, and we have open forum also tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, also the next question is uh, not pertaining to the topic. And the next question is also not pertaining to the topic. Now here's one. What type of dua do you make when, ex- when you're expecting or wanting to have a baby. 
Well, I've never been pregnant, but I do know few people that have been pregnant. And they've asked me the question also, what dua do you make when you're expecting or wanting to have a baby? <clears throat> there is no specific dua to the best of my knowledge that you say, ah, oh, yes it is, yes it is, yes. If someone has a Quran, a copy of the Quran, you can look, I think it's in Surah Ali Imran or Surah Maryam, I think. Uh, just a minute, I can give you the verse, insha'Allah, if you just be patient. Insha'Allah, I think it's Surah Maryam. Or Ali Imran. Maybe Ali Imran. Oh, let's check Maryam, insha'Allah. Anyone here, half of the Quran? No half of the Quran here? Shame on you. Shame on you. Shouldn't have one half of the Quran. Uh, yes. I think it's here in Surah Maryam where well I don't see it but there is a verse in the Quran where the mother of Maryam it's an Ali Imran I tell you it's Ali Imran the, the mother of Maryam made a vow that she would uh, give her child in service to Allah, to the temple, to the temple. The scholars of Islam uh, say that it's permissible to take statements like this and add or subtract words to the ayah itself. You're not changing the verse. You're just taking the dua itself and saying, for instance, Oh Allah, if it is a boy, I want to offer my child, this boy child, in jihad. Or, oh Allah, if it's a girl, I want, oh Allah, make her uh, a righteous woman, uh, memorizing the Quran, memorizing Bukhari and Muslim, and uh, whatever. It's permissible to do this. When you're pregnant, as for those who are wanting to have a child, the dua also in Surah Maryam, where Zakaria, he said, وَإِنِّي خِفْتُ الْمَوَالِيَ مِنْ وَرَائِي وَكَانَتِ امْرَأَةِ عَاقِرٍ فَهَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا He said, I fear that I will not have a successor after me because my wife is barren. So, O oh Allah, give me from yourself a successor, a wali. This dua, uh, like the other dua, uh, verse of Quran, can be altered in a manner that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the child without saying your wife is barren. I made this dua, my wife of almost 17 years, the first 10 years of our marriage. The month of Shawwal, the month after Ramadan, we've been married, inshallah, 17 years, alhamdulillah. And for 10 of those 17 years, we didn't have a child. We didn't have a child. And we were doing everything that we could do to have a child. Going to the house, everything. And I started implementing this dua, of course also drinking Zem Zem, using black seeds, making, trying to remember those times that dua accepted, and the places that dua accepted. And finally, alhamdulillah, I have a daughter. Sometimes I wish she would go back where she came from, <laughs> but alhamdulillah I have a daughter. Alhamdulillah. Uh, this question is not pertaining to the dua either. Uh, this question is not pertaining to dua. Before you conclude your discussion, uh, can you recap one, two, three, when dua is accepted, and also show us again how you put your hand, right, how you position your hand. Uh, I don't remember what the one, two, three, one, two, what they meant by the one, two, three.
Is that is that what's mentioned by this this note? But I think I think this person I think this is the sisters, right? I think they mean something else. They said one, two, three. I don't remember. I don't know exactly what they're talking about. Um, but inshallah, maybe we can. No, but there were quite a, there were quite a few of one, two, threes there. So I don't remember exactly what it was. But as far as how you put your hands, uh, I put my hands like you see these little figurines that the praying hand, excuse me, the praying hands figurines that the Christians have, and like the Hindus, they pray like this, and the Sikhs, the Sikhs also pray like this. This is not from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sunnah was to raise his hands with his arms raised and his palms facing upward. Oh, by the way, there's an unauthentic hadith that says put your hands downward with the palms facing downward. It's an unauthentic hadith. Don't utilize that hadith. It's not authentic. Yeah. I'm sorry I even said it. Maybe some people may try to just start doing it. Huh? And that's all the questions from the sisters. There's no more questions pertaining to uh, the topic. We'll save these for tomorrow, inshallah, and um, and maybe we can deal with them. If there are any from the brothers, inshallah, about purification of the soul by way of du'a, no. Not the best du'a, the du'a, the sunnah, is to make du'a before tasneem. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No. The question is for the sisters or the brothers who can't hear, are you permitted to delay your taslim if you're following the imam so that you can make dua? The answer is no. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith transmitted by al-Bukhari and others, he said, al-imamu ju'il al-imamu liyutimma bih, fala takhtalifu alayhi. And the statement for la alayhi is in the Musnad ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Uh, it says the Imams are appointed to be followed, so don't contradict or oppose them. The Imams are appointed to be followed, so don't contradict or oppose them. You have to do what they do. So if the Imam says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to the right to the left, then you have to say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to the right to the left. Even if you didn't finish your du'a. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. The brother is asking for a du'a that's a short and sweet that we can say quickly uh, uh, tonight. And that short and sweet du'a is Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah Oh Allah, I ask you for jannah Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah That's pretty easy, right? May Allah give it to us. Amen. Now. <laughs> There is a dua, the brother's asking the question, is there any dua that we can say when going into jihad? And he mentioned that the jihad is not just confronting the, um, um, the human being, but it's also confronting the jinn. And this may sound silly to some people, but Allah mentions it in the Quran 
that we have shayateen, shaitan from among the jinn and the men. And the Prophet also has mentioned this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, he said that there are some people who have the bodies of human beings and the hearts of shaitan. The Prophet of, this, the Prophet of Islam mentioned this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is one dua um, <coughs> that we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned, that is mentioned in the Quran, which is, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ That's one. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ also we have أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم which you add السميع and العليم which are two of the names of Allah the hearer, the knower أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم and this is something that we should say when we open up the Quran and also we have أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من همزه ونفخه ونفه O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you, uh, the, the Allah, the hearer, the, the, hearer, the, the, the knower, from a shaitan, the, the rejected, from his hem, his nafkh, and his nafkh. His hem, his nafkh, and his nafkh. His blowing, his poetry, and his pumping up with pride. And Allah knows that. We also have a dua that the Prophet wasallam, when there was uh, any fear of a people, that he used to say, Allahumma inna naj'aluka fi nuhurihim wa na'udhu bika min shururihim. O oh Allah, I put you in their necks. I put you, Allah, in their necks. Doesn't mean you put Allah in the person's neck. It means you put the fear of Allah. O oh Allah, I put the fear of you in their throat. Right? And I seek, we seek refuge with you from their evil. We seek refuge with you from their evil. And also there's a dua that we say we, when we enter into any, any type of new home or a new apartment or a hotel room or anything like that, we say, أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ تَامَّةِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقَ أَعُوذُ بِكَلِمَاتِ, الت... أعوذ بكلمات اللَّهِ تَامَّةِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقَ I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil of that which he created. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says this when they go into a room, and this also can be used for other things, that uh, nothing will harm him in, when he, until he returns home. So there are many dua for seeking refuge uh, against a shaitan from among the human beings in jihad and also the jinn. Uh, as for specific jihad fighting, we can make the dua that Prophet Dawood made رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ O oh Allah, pour down on us patience and make our feet firm and give us victory over the disbelieving people. Right? And I'd just like to make a side note to that, that if you don't purify your heart, then your feet will never be firm. If you don't purify your heart, <laughs> and make your heart firm, then your feet are going to run. Your feet are going to run, they're going to move, they're going to be shakable. But if you make that heart firm in the deen and obedience of Allah, then those feet will never move. I don't care who's in front of you. Allah Akbar. Now. You talking about dua or salah? <laughs> okay, the brother's asking the question and I'm kind of confused. It's not the brother who's confusing me, it's just me understanding it. The brother is asking, uh, does the dua and or the salah have to be in the Arabic language? Is that what you're asking me? But you're asking me specifically about dua. It's better, of course, to make the dua in the language that the dua was revealed in, which is the Arabic language. It's better for, for a couple of reasons. One of the main reasons 
why it's better to learn how to make these dua in Arabic is because the richness of the Arabic language it is so rich and the, and the meanings of the words are so rich you can never express it in the English language even as rich as Urdu is and Persian I think Persian is more richer than Urdu the language of the Iranians Persian, Farsi, 